You're listening to the Whole Hog Football Podcast, sponsored by Bud Anderson Home Services. Every Monday through Friday during the Razorbacks Football Training Camp, bringing you the latest news, position analysis, and more. Here's your hosts, Matt Jones and Scotty Bordelon. Arkansas went through its first preseason scrimmage on Saturday. It was the most comprehensive scrimmage that Sam Pittman said the team will go through this preseason. Today, we'll take a look back at what some of the highlights were from the scrimmage. It wasn't open to the media, but in discussions with uh, Coach Pittman, with some of the players and with others, you know, you're able to kind of put together a little bit, piece together what it looked like. And so we'll talk about that with Tom Murphy of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and Scotty Bordelon of WholeHogSports.com. And later in this episode, we'll continue our position analysis with a look at the Razorbacks tight ends. And Scotty, the first thing that came to mind or or the first thing that stood out to me in listening to uh, Sam Pittman speak about the scrimmage afterwards Saturday was that uh, didn't sound like the quarterback play was was very sharp. He was asked about K.J. Jefferson, said that he's had better days, he's had worse days. And when he was asked, you know, how he would sum up his performance, he said just kind of average. Yeah, and I think KJ was 100% with Sam on that. And, you know, listening to KJ, he, I don't know, I feel like you can almost tell what kind of a day a guy had, you know, even if you've already got some prior knowledge, like with what, with what Sam Pittman said about him. But KJ came in and he just, he didn't seem like he was real happy about the performance he had. And I think, you know, he had some, uh, I think they went against the second team defense at times and then went against the first team defense at times. I think there's a, there was obviously there were some throws that he wanted back. And that's what, that's what really I'm kind of looking for with KJ out of this preseason is do we see a jump in his accuracy? Do we see a jump in his precision? And, you know, how is he throwing the ball down the field, like vertically, you know, is his, is his accuracy there? Is he going to be able to hit guys and be able to take the top off of, off of defenses because that's I think that's what made Arkansas's you know passing game you know pretty pretty dangerous at times last year uh, with Felipe Franks and guys like Mike Woods and, and Traylon Burks, Davion Warren, um, but he he just wasn't wasn't real happy. I think I think one drive ended in a touchdown. You know he hit I think Kendall Catalan for a touchdown and it sounds like Kendall Catalan did most of the work. He caught like a 15 yard pass and then took it 50 or I think 35 extra yards to the house. But I think a couple other drives ended in field goals. And if you're KJ, you know, he's probably still thinking about those drives. You know, you, you got to punch those in for seven instead of settling for three. When you've got a quarterback who's like KJ, a dual threat quarterback, you're, you're basically asking him to be a pocket quarterback in these scrimmages because they're off limits to being hit. There's really not a lot they can do with their legs. Absolutely right. And one thing we have to remember is that he's going against a defensive line that these guys are really – angling for playing time and trying to make their mark in this camp. And so you got returning guys like Eric Gregory and Nichols and Torian Carter, um, Zach Williams, Mateo Soli, who they're feeling that, that pressure. So everybody wants to do their best. And I think Trey Williams had the best day, the transfer from Missouri, and they feel like Markel Lutze and John Ridgeway are, are going to give them really good contributions. So, and, and you're right, when a play, uh, when KJ doesn't see his first couple of three reads where he would take off in a game and you'd see a positive result, a lot of times they're blowing him dead if somebody pats him on the thigh. And it's just a different outcome. Um, and it looks, looks differently in a scrimmage than it does in the game. I don't want to say that to excuse KJ because he clearly said he left plays on the field. Um, there was a, a couple of other things he could have done differently. And... It's just something that you see in a first scrimmage. You know, I think the defense is a little ahead of the offense and there were, there were holding penalties. There were pass interference penalties. And that could have been something that could have been a bigger reception on a, on a play that KJ threw. So uh, if I could give KJ some advice, it might be loosened up in front of the media a little bit. He just seems really tight and serious. And maybe that's just his, how he's composed as a, as a person but just a very serious kid and uh, want him to have fun out there. It, I guess I don't, I don't know that we really know um, all of the turnovers that, that happened in that scrimmage, but it doesn't – I don't know. I know I think somebody, maybe Jalen Catalan, said that Malik Chavis came up with a pick and maybe some of the other turnovers were maybe you know, a running back putting the ball on the ground. But it, 
I don't know. I guess KJ had a pretty clean day in that regard. So that's maybe a positive that you take from it. Um, otherwise, you know, just, you know, just keep repping those, those routes with your receivers and just keep, keep sharpening, keep sharpening that. I think he'll be fine. Right. And I think that they just hold, they're holding him to a high standard and he's holding himself to a high standard. And you have to be honest. If you had a very average day, just be honest about it. Don't say it was better than what it was. And I think it's a good thing. Scotty mentioned Kendall Catalan, the the big reception he had. Tom, it seems like every practice we keep hearing about big plays that he's making. Uh, you're, you're getting to the point that you really expect him to be a factor in the wide receiver position. I think top five, top six in that rotation, if a, jo- a guy just gets open and then he makes something happen when he catches the ball, then you put him on the field. It doesn't matter. You know, if he's 5'8 or whatever, 5'9, whatever height Kendall is, he might be six feet, but he's not a super tall guy. And we saw him get open in the one on one against some of the better DBs. And whoever was covering him, it, 15 yard out, the guy missed the tackle and he's gone. So uh, you could tell in Jalen Catalan's voice, his brother, very proud of, of what his, his brother's getting done on the offensive side of the ball. One of the things that was missing on, on Saturday was, uh, or one of the people was Ricky Stromberg, obviously uh, out with that knee injury. Sam Pittman did say that he thought Stromberg uh, might be back or probably should be back by the second scrimmage that they have um, this weekend. So that changes the offensive line though, obviously. And, and it sounds like Ty Clary has been playing center for the most part uh, with Stromberg out. I, I thought it was kind of interesting guys listening to uh, KJ Jefferson uh, you know, talk about how they're they're working on the side, trying to get their snap together. They said that, or Jefferson said that he thought Clary might be a little bit rusty in, in terms of his snaps just because he hasn't played the you know, the position in so long. Uh, what are your thoughts about the offensive line without Stromberg? Um, I think if if I'm if I'm Sam Pittman and I'm Cody Kennedy, even if Stromberg is ready to go by Saturday, I hold him out. He talks about how they can't really afford to lose any of their key guys. I'd say Ricky Stromberg is a really key guy. We know what he can do. Uh, let the guy's knee heal properly. Um, Ty Clary, I'm sure in the, the practice stuff they do, they use all their potential centers snapping the ball. So he's, I think he's probably continued to snap it. It's just a matter of, um, you know, kind of the scrimmage setting when it's live, so to speak, that, that Ty hadn't had as much work. And I think he would be a good backup center if they needed to have him there. The good, the good thing about where the Razorbacks are as an offensive line is this. When Stromberg comes back and then Clary goes back to right guard, that gives him Clary, Bo Lemmer. Then you've got Luke Jones, Brady Latham on the other side, guys who've played in games. And I, I, just, I just feel like the depth is going to be there. They just have to be on the same page. Because I think their D line is is probably winning more of the battles against them right now. And when it comes to, you know, the Rice game on September fourth and Texas the following week, uh, you'd like to see that they've made progress in the off season. I felt like after Saturday's scrimmage, we were able maybe to glean a little bit more about special teams than we have been at at any other point during the preseason. Uh, Pittman said that uh, Cam Little, the freshman from Moore, Oklahoma. Is really kicking well for him. I think he said that uh, he made all of his kicks during the uh, scrimmage on Saturday, including uh, some of from over 50 yards. Um, he, he mentioned the punting competition between uh, uh, Reed Bauer and uh, Sam Loy. And we're even starting to hear some things about re- return games, Scotty. Just what have been your takeaways from what we've been told about special teams? Yeah, I think Sam Pittman is a fan of Cam Little. I think that is that's one of the the big takeaways because Sam has you know when he's been asked about special teams previously, I mean before even well before Saturday, he's mentioned Cam Little, you know, just on his own, just kind of bragging about him a little bit. And I think he hit Tom, if I'm not mistaken, I think he hit 37, 46, and and 52 in the scrimmage. Uh, we don't know if he took any more kicks than that or if he if he missed one, but those are pretty solid distances. Um, and like I mentioned earlier with KJ, you know, obviously as a quarterback, you want to lead your offense to go get six every time. But if you can't, it's also really, really, really important that you've got a consistent guy that can put the ball, as Sam Pittman said, through those two little deals. And it's, Cam has been the most consistent guy for them, I think, right now. And that's 
super, super valuable. And Sam Pittman was talking the other day. They put Cam Little in a kind of a hurry type field goal situation from what was it, 57 yards? And he said he made it with ease. And that's, you know, that's it's sounding like, you know, Connor Limpert was almost, we felt like he was almost automatic whenever he he jogged out on the field. You know, we haven't seen Cam Little other than the the spring game to this point. I think he had two short field goals in that game, but that, you know, a, a guy that can that can boot it from from a good distance, that's a that's a real weapon to have. And I, I think they've got I think they got their guy in Cam Little right now. Pittman said that he thought the 57 yarder would have been good from 65 that they had in that field goal rush. Tom, we've also learned, you know, who they're using at kickoff return, punt return. I think it's been interesting to hear Sam Pittman talk about how you know, he's a little nervous letting his return guys take hits. And he said it basically comes down to, as a coach, you know, what are you comfortable with? And he said, you know, right now I don't feel real comfortable letting my return guys take hits. And I like that idea, especially when you feel like you're kind of light at return men. It's gonna. It's a new day for the Razorbacks, you guys. Um, when you talk about Greg Brooks, or um, possibly uh, Bryce Stevens at punt return, and then you know Nathan Perotti is maybe your kind of safe catch guy, which is what they did most of last year. But the weird part of it is, is they have veteran return men who've done good work in Traylon Burks at punt return, and Devion Warren at kick return, and it seems to me like they're gonna go to newer guys, and it's it. It's almost like a fascinating new chapter when you think, well, you're going to have um, somebody returning kicks that we haven't seen do it before. I mean, they're talking about Miles Slusher. Um, and who is the other uh, kick return guy, Scotty, they mentioned? Yeah, I think I remember Greg Brooks. Uh, I know Nathan Prody has been back doing some some punt stuff, but that that's not really new, I wouldn't say. Um, Bryce Stevens is kind of an interesting – name to me because I think you know we've talked about him before I think he's probably gonna he might have a spot on that travel roster just you know he can help you at receiver but I think he you know he's got some some experience returning punts and kickoffs for, in high school and he's a you know they've raved about his speed uh, Kenny Guyton talked about it Sam has talked about it several times KJ too when I asked about you know those those three freshman receivers I think he's going to help them there look slippery maybe a, a little evasive um I can't remember who that other name it was, is. It was Josh Oglesby. So Josh Oglesby. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just get, just get track speed on the field. I like that. Just, you know, just kind of see if you can make something happen on special teams. So, I mean, you got to make, you got to make life as easy as possible uh, or as easy as you can on your offense sometimes. And, you know, you give them a, a short field to work with. You know, that, that's always good. And as a side note, you know, there was points last year where it felt like the coverage teams were just getting down there on them. And I thought in the Florida game, I was really frustrated that uh, Devion returned a couple that were kicked down to like the one or two or even in the goal inside the goal line. And they were getting starting drives inside the 25. And that was the case on the one he got hurt on. Uh, I just couldn't believe that they didn't fair catch that that kickoff in that situation. Think back to Frank Broyles. Uh... You guys have heard the, you know, the four commandments, I think, of, of special teams. I think one of them was thou shall not let the, uh, the, the ball hit the ground. And I, I think about that a lot in terms of hey, they didn't return punts a whole lot last year, but they also didn't let it hit the ground a whole lot. And, and I think there is something to be said for that in, in terms of yardage. And Graylin Burke still might be returning punts if he followed one of those commandments. Like, I think that was kind of what got Scott Fountain's attention in the first place. You know, he lets the ball hit mm -hmm. and then it takes, you know, I think Sam Pittman came in one time and said it. Traylon Burks just letting punts hit and roll gave took away almost forty yards of field position. I mean that 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 can't happen. That was really a problem in the first couple of games, and, and I think that's about when he got taken out of that position, right? Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I mean, they, I mean, they even worked with his, you know, the way he catches punts. And so, I, I still think Traylon Burks is a really good option there. And I wish that you know that they would maybe. You know, just just tell him to follow that commandment. Like, don't let the ball hit the ground. Like, you're dangerous when the ball is in your hands. Don't let it hit. Yeah, you know what? I think Traylon. I think he got a little bit gun shy with his knee because it feels like there was a point early last season where his knee got tweaked, and then he missed. I think he missed the Auburn game, and it was after that. I don't think he returned punts anymore. So I feel like maybe maybe he backed off and had a, some concern for his knee. The Whole Life Football Podcast is brought to you by Bud Anderson Home Services. Each day, 
This week, we're going to continue our position analysis, and today we're going to talk about the Razorbacks tight ends. We talked about this last week that it, it, it's it's a it's an issue right now in, in terms of bodies because you know they moved Levi Draper to tight end and, and and now he's out. You know, probably isn't going to play again. Uh, you know, college football again. Coyle and Jackson still working his way back from the knee injury. Aaron Outley isn't able to practice right now because of the knee injury that he suffered in high school. And so it's really Hudson Henry and Blake Kern, who were, you know, solid producers a year ago, uh, but they've got to find some more players behind them. Yeah, they really do. And it just depends on how you want to utilize your tight ends. I mean, it, if you have to only go with two and maybe a few reps from a third guy here and there, then you just adjust your offense accordingly. What do you want your tight end for? You want them to be good in line blockers. You want them, if things break down, that KJ can trust them to catch a ball over a safety or just, just be open. I think Blake Kern has proved that. And I think Hudson Henry has proved that he can be a, a dynamic playmaker. But if they're in the game, they have to be able to block when needed. And I think Nathan Bax might be might end up being the third tight end option because it, it seems like from what Dowell Logan said that Colin Sutherland might be a few pounds and a little bit more knowledge away from getting on the field. So it may be that they've already accepted the fact that they won't be in three tight ends very much, which would be more goal line short yardage things. And that the two tight formations might be slightly more limited, but I do think that Kern and Hudson can give you an advantage against safeties and linebackers uh, and have the experience to prove that. Dominic Johnson has moved over to tight end. He's still playing some running back too. Uh, but Scotty, it, it, it seems like, you know, it's almost like an H back type position for him. And it, just in terms of, of how they're using him right now. Right. And uh, he, during the scrimmage, you know, he split time with tight end and running back and Sam Pittman was saying that, you know, Dominic Johnson had a, a decent day running the football too. I'm just, I'm going to be curious to see, you know, how his, you know, maybe skill set at tight end develops. And, you know, I, I remember I wrote about, Nathan Bax earlier in the week, he's a, I think he's a legitimate option for that, for that number three spot. And it's, it's interesting because I was looking at some of his stats and his, his bio on Arkansas's website the other day, he had more tackles than offensive snaps played last year. And so that's a guy that doesn't have just a, a whole lot of game experience, but Hudson Henry was saying that Bax has, you know, he's, he's changed his body up in the off season and he's, Actually, he's very similarly built to Blake Kern. I think Kern still got about 10 pounds on backs, but he's kind of an intriguing third option. And it's kind of, he's really is a relatively unknown player. He's a walk on who, you know, he's basically to this point, all of his contributions have been on special teams. Mm -hmm. So we really don't even know what kind of hands he has either. But um, I think Dal Loggins likes the way that he works, he's a quick learner. Um, he said he's whenever they grade out backs is, is pretty consistent. I don't know if that means he's consistently okay or you know if he's just he's a, been a pretty good player and he's been that way throughout camp. Uh, I, I think it's kind of important to figure out who that that third guy is because you know Hudson Henry's battled injuries the entire time he's been here and then you know if he's down, Blake Kern is all of a sudden your number one and, you know, they want to try to go 12 personnel at some times you're going to, you're going to need another body. Absolutely. And, you know, it may be, it's going to be intriguing to watch this, but it could be that with Dominic Johnson, the H back, it could be a guy who motions, who becomes a lead blocker. So essentially a fullback and, you know, uh, it wouldn't be an eye backfield, but a lead blocker for Traylon Smith, if they like the way he can, get to the edge and maybe take a linebacker out in a blocking situation. So that's something to keep an eye on as opposed to the standard connected tight end or disconnected tight end to have a moving one. I want to talk about Hudson Henry for a minute because the expectations were, you know, just, just out of this world for him when he came into uh, Fayetteville, of course, his brother, great, great tight end, NFL tight end, uh, Hunter Henry. But Hudson was the number one tight end coming out of high school. I think most of the, you know, the recruiting sites had in that. And I always felt like that was a little unfair 
to Hudson because of the way, yes, he was a tight end at Pulaski Academy, but at PA, the tight end is just another receiver, you know, you know, and so it's like he had to learn to play the position a different way when he came into, you know, in, into college and he's gained somewhere, I think in the 30, 35 pound range since he came in, you know, he's having to learn how to, you know, he's, he's had to learn how to be a blocker. He's had learned or had to learn a lot of, you know, different ways to play tight end. Then he played it at Pulaski Academy. Tom, do we feel like this is going to be the the breakout year that people have been waiting for from him? Scotty mentioned, you know, that he, he he faced some injuries last year that probably limited him some. Yeah, if he keeps his health, I think it certainly could be, and he'll certainly get the opportunity, the, the reps to do that. We'll have to remember his first camp, he got a concussion, I think, early on and was set back, and it seemed like um, he was a little bit uh, slow on picking up the offense. So, so I, he got the red shirt out of that year, and then – he caught the touchdown against Mississippi State last year, and you felt like maybe he was on his way, but then he got injured. So I think he will be in prime position to get it, at least as many reps as Blake Kern does and really start showing. Like if if they know that they can get him matched up against a like a nickel or something and 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 get him open downfield to try to hit some some bigger plays with Hudson Henry. And um at this stage, I think you'd have to consider him like a under underrated potential X factor for the Razorbacks. Yeah. I remember writing earlier this summer, I wrote five potential breakout candidates and Hudson, I think is a, is a clear guy who could, you know, he's in the running for that. Um, so I think we, we understand that he's, you know, probably better than 15 or 20 catches and 200 yards a season and a, and a touchdown here and there. Um, I think it's just about him staying healthy. And I think Arkansas's tight ends room, you know, as long as those top two guys stay healthy, you know, I don't worry about their consistency or their, you know, lack of ability to, to block in the run game. I mean, I mean, those, those two guys are, they're going to be paying, they're paying attention to what Dal Loggins is telling them. And I think the spring helped them both a lot in terms of maybe the the blocking in the run game because Cody Kennedy was preaching, you know, physicality, 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 and being a force for good. And, you know, they're under Dow Loggins now, and, you know, he's very analytically minded. And so that's, I think, in the course of a year, you've gotten to see two different sides of the tight end group or two different ways to teach tight ends. And, it, you, you know, you put that into a ball. You know, I think that a tight ends room could be pretty good. Um, Blake Kern, I don't worry about his consistency. Like he had a pretty good year last year. And that was a guy that, you know, going into last season, didn't have a catch to his name in his career. And he, he performed pretty well. I think the leadership is good in that room. Um, just, I think it's just nailing down that, that third guy right now. I think, I think Bax is, is a good, good number three to follow those top two. Kern was in a, a complimentary role last year. Tom, do we think Coyle and Jackson could, could fit into that complimentary type role this year? I know he's coming back from knee injuries, uh, but this, you know, I mean, this is, I think this is the end of the line for him in terms of eligibility. Another, another well, guy who's dealt with a lot of injuries. Yeah, he could. And, you know, he got back into practice last week. He missed the first few days still rehabbing. I just hope that his knee is healthy. You know, we know he's a, a young father and, uh, you know, he's got a, a d different priorities as well, but I know football means a lot to him. And I just remember, you know, a, a really good start as a freshman against Ryan Pulley, as I mentioned the other day, and uh, just hate that he's had so many knee issues. And I, I think the, I, the answer is he could have a chance to be a breakout. He's got, he's got to be able to block because if you just put him in there, then they're going to treat him as a pass catcher. So he has to be able to block as well, and uh, we'll just see how that shapes out. But certainly with his experience and his pedigree, you'd think that he uh, could be a contributor. You know, and when we talk about a breakout season, again, we're talking about in a complimentary role. We, we thought it was a breakout season last year for Blake Kern, and that was a 20-catch, 200-yard, two-touchdown type season. At wholehogsports.com today, you can read more about the tight ends. Tom has got a tight end position analysis. We'll be back on Tuesday for another podcast as we continue our position analysis and work our way through the Razorbacks preseason. For Tom Murphy and Scotty Bordelon, I am Matt Jones. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The preceding has been a production of WholeHogSports.com. Look for our latest podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at WholeHogSports.com for the latest news and commentary.